Hi, it's me again, Chris Holden, uh, teacher of the course, What Are Numbers Anyway? Uh, Honors 2221, the spring of 2021. And this video is a little bit of an introduction to how the course itself is going to work. Uh, first bits to know are that you're in this course, that I'm in this course, and that there, there's a, a third uh, kind of person in this course, I guess you would say. Um, it's another teacher, a student teacher. It's Andrew Coffey. He's a student in the honors program. He's a math and physics major and is graduating this semester. And so he'll sort of play a third role in our class that we're lucky enough to have this time around. Um, this class is in honors, which means that it's based around the idea of a group of people, a small group of people, working together around a topic area. And so the idea is to have it based on discussion and collaboration, which might seem a little strange for a math class. Um, and while it's not a usual way that, that math classes are run, it's a very good way to do math, one that is, is unfortunately rare in most people's experiences. Um, so there's probably some getting used to there on all of our parts of being able to do math together not least because of the role that intimidation tends to play around mathematical subjects. Um, intentionally or not, math is very often employed to shut people down. Um, and it, it's related to the idea that, that numbers and arithmetic are objective, logical, mechanical, and there's no way to disagree with them. And so if you are not a mathy person, you uh, cannot enter the arena where they're being discussed. Um, in lots of ways, large and small, this tends to define the ways that, that people relate to each other through math. And our first and most important job is going to be to push back against that. Um, and one of the ways that I hope to ensure that that's a possibility for us is to find ways to empower each one of you to feel like you get to lead those discussions and you get to participate in those discussions. And it is not a prerequisite to have all the answers, to be fast with the calculations, um, to get everything right. The, the real lesson for people who study math and how it works about sort of how math achieves this ability to sort of be precise and have answers that everyone can agree to isn't that it's, it's sort of mechanical and that the answers are known right away, but it's that we keep after them. So this process of discussion is supposed to result in the kind of certainty we associate with math, not begin with it. So in our discussions, in the, the topics that we take on, in the homework problems, there very often is a right answer that we're looking for. And we often sort of construct our conversations in terms of looking for that right answer. But the idea is to achieve the kind of informed consensus that makes that the right answer eventually. Not to start out um, by putting people into two groups, whether they know the answer or not. So that's our main job. Now, how we get there, we're going to do a lot of things. We've got some good books to read. Our main book by Leo Corey is A Brief History of Numbers. And that gives us most of the bullet points um, for answering the question of, for the numbers that like normal people are familiar with and that get used in math and science, where did they come from? How did they come about? It doesn't have all the points of, of interest along that story. And then there's also questions about numbers and where they come from and how they work that are not on that narrow road of leading to things like the decimals. Um, so we will entertain some questions in addition to the ones that Corey helps us with, but that's a, a good first approximation of what we're after. Um, and kind of like any other human technology, it may seem after the fact like these numbers were sort of purpose built to do just the right things and nothing else, but the way that they're made and the, and the way that they work turns out to be a whole lot more like accidental and historically contingent than, than most people would seem to guess. Um, and so for me, by looking at this story about how numbers came to be, we get to see 
a much more human side to math. Uh, we get to see the inventiveness and creativity that's always driven it, and that hopefully can inspire you to approach uh, the subject that way. Um, so besides our books, besides our weekly discussions where we'll have uh, hopefully very involved, uh, active conversations, even though we're trying to have them through Zoom since the pandemic has us unable to occupy the same small room together like we would normally do. Um, there will be short homework assignments, I think about 10 this semester, each one of about maybe three questions. Now, these are problem sets, kind of like you might expect in a math class, but they're also different from what you might expect. In particular, I'd like you to consider them as writing assignments first and foremost. There will be some answer that you're after and we'll be able to know some bit of whether you've done it right based on whether you get the right answer. But the point of these is not to show me the right answer and to show me the work that is sort of requisite to claim that it is the right answer, but to explain to someone else what's going on. And one of the neat things about um, this kind of writing uh, in mathematics is that there's a lot of different tools that you can employ the way you want to to show someone else what's going on. We have words, we have equations, we have diagrams, we even have white space as an important tool in the tool belt of trying to show someone what's going on. It also allows for a tremendous amount of creativity um, when it comes to how you want to go about these things. And so it'll be interesting to see how each of us approaches the situation differently and how we can tackle this question of communication. Um, it also means that for the, for, for the questions where I'm asking you to come up with a certain answer, you are not totally on your own to come up with that. We should be here to help each other with any sort of difficulty along those lines. Um, whether it's, it's me answering a question or another student, um, we should think about ourselves as trying to all get to the same place together. Um, so while it is worth spending some time banging your head against the wall trying to solve a problem, once that gets really painful, we need to learn how to ask each other for help. And that's going to be in addition to like communication and trying to read something difficult and sort of see beneath the lines, in addition to those sort of basic things, um, learning how to help each other move ahead is the other sort of important learning outcome from this class that I'd like you to, to sort of keep in your mind and to keep at the forefront and to think about how you're going to approach it. Um, so there's the, these small homework assignments that are writing assignments. Uh, the other major thing that you'll be doing is each one of you, twice this semester, will be teaching us some little bit of something. So this could be mathematical theorems and their proofs. Um, in fact, the first two that we'll have during the second week are that. The first one is the theorem and proof that there are infinitely many primes, and the uh, fact that the square root of two is an irrational number, meaning it is not a fraction. There's no fraction of whole numbers that's equal to the square root of two. Other uh, instances of teaching might be about historical context for part of the story. So like the what the Bakshali manuscript is, let's say, and the role that it plays in helping us pin down where decimals come from. Um, there's other ones that might be more calculational in nature. So like how do you do some basic arithmetic with the complex numbers? Uh, that might be, that's, that's one that's in there. So each person twice this semester is going to teach us a little bit of something. And then based on these small lessons, uh, my hope is that that can help us drive into um, an active and productive conversation. Um, it's also what I'm hoping makes the Zoom meetings a little bit more lively than they might be if Andrew and I were leading all the discussions. A final piece of the puzzle in terms of like the, the specifics of how the, what the class is and how it's being run is that we're going to have what I'm calling quizzes, although they're a little bit different than, than quizzes are usually. 
um, for each thing that we're reading, for each unit, I've gone and written down some important quiz-like questions. And I will share this entire list with you at the beginning of each unit. And then what is going to happen is at the end of the unit, I'm going to take some subset of these, like 10 questions, and create an actual quiz that you have to fill out and take and turn in. Um, but this quiz will not be timed. I mean, it will be in the sense that you'll have like a day or so to finish it. Um, and it's also open everything, meaning that uh, you don't have to pull these things out of your head and put them on the paper. You just need to get them on there somehow. Now, my hope is that having that set of questions ahead of time will give us as a group of people the span of that whole unit a chance to go and figure out what those answers to those quiz questions are and write them down and produce a common resource that anyone in the class can reference when it comes time to actually take the quiz. If you're up for it, I'm also very interested but not requiring um, some participation at the level of quiz question creation and selection. So if you have a, uh, something important that can be turned into a quiz question from these units, I would highly encourage you to share them with us early on. Or if you find from that list that there are some questions that seem more or less central or important, um, to help us identify those before time comes time to turn them into a quiz. Now the purpose for these quiz questions is to give us some form of like basic accountability to doing the reading and interacting with each other around it. Um, it's not really so much important that you know these particular questions and their answers, but it's an activity that we can do that can help us keep up with the things that we know we should be doing anyway, but are easy to let slide when you've got like a organic chemistry test or something like that. Um, so teaching, homework questions, quiz questions, those are the three things that make up the course. And then of course, this consistent backbone of us meeting twice a week and talking to each other, working through these stories and these problems. Um, so that's, that's most of the course right there. Um, besides the specific assignments, the thing that I really, really would encourage you to find a way to bring to this course is a level of interest and enthusiasm. And that's not always easy to find with math. So it might just take some spending some time with it. And then the courage to get involved. Um, it's really easy to sort of feel to yourself that what you have to say about the math doesn't matter um, and that only the smart people in the class uh, you know, should be driving that discussion. And that's too bad because then what happens is everyone feels like they're not good enough to be the smart person in class and to drive those discussions and then the class ends up a ghost town. And that can mean like, our discussion forums aren't populated. There's no one asking and answering questions or bringing up topics that they care about. Um, and it also means that our Zoom sessions, the times when we're talking to each other over video conferencing, are likewise dead quiet. And those present their own challenges in that uh, crosstalk is a real big problem with video conferencing in a way that it's not in the classroom. It's harder to sort of form into small groups at will and to, you know, make participation more flexible. But I can also tell you that it feels really isolating to not be connected or to feel that your presence isn't an active one. Um, I know that I ended up teaching a whole lot of black rectangles last semester and despite my enthusiasm for the material and like the good discussions we did have it was a pretty big downer um, and, and I sort of got the feeling that other people were feeling that way too and no one really wanted it to be that way but the simple decision to like avoid the awkwardness of saying something that was wrong 
made you know, 100 times by each person in the class has a cumulative effect that made it not the best place to be instead of a place that invigorated people. So whatever you can do to bring yourself into this and to make it feel like a place you want to be, um, please do. And let me know what else I can do to make it work that way for you. Um, let's see what else. Oh, I should mention, so I mentioned that we're going to be video conferencing for these things, Tuesday and Thursday, 11 to 12, 15. Um, if you all want to record these sessions, we can, but I want to make sure to get everyone's uh, input before making a decision like that. The other parts of our course are we're going to have a Discord server. So that will be for announcements. It will be for the discussions that I hope go beyond our class sessions. Um, any discussions about like the problems or the quiz questions or anything like that, any help people need in planning their teaching sessions, that's that's what Discord's for. Um, we also might be able to move our video calls there, whether it's our big group sessions or even if it's just one-on-one -on -one help that people are looking for. Maybe we could find a, a, an office hour that works real well for people. Um, and then the, the final piece is Google Drive. Uh, we're going to have a shared folder in Google Drive, all of the official documents like the quick start guide and the templates for the problem sets and our schedule and stuff will be there. But it's also where you can put your work and get feedback on it and show it to other people. Um, and I think that should be about it. I mean, all of these details will become real as we try and enact them. And one of the things I would also encourage you to do is to communicate about any possible misunderstandings or questions you have. Um, it's easy for stuff to get lost and confused, and it's nothing on you if that happens to happen. Where it's a matter of personal responsibility is when you choose to acknowledge it and do something about it. Ask the question about what's something in the class that you don't understand how or why to do it, or... Um, you know, if something's going on in your life to make sure that we know what's going on or at least enough about it to, to be able to not just feel like this person's ghosting on us. Um, good communication is impossible to overvalue. And so I, I want to encourage you to, to sort of feel like we are people you can communicate with, whether it's about math or it's about, you know, problems with assignments or, or like how to get into Google Drive or anything like that, anything technical. If there are technical problems, um, we're happy to help you through them. If there are math problems, we're happy to help you through them. Um, beyond that, I don't know if we're the, the best people to talk to, but we'll certainly try and we'll help you find someone to talk to if that ends up being necessary. Um, so I'm excited to learn about numbers with you all. I'm especially excited to have Andrew as part of this. Um, having that sort of layer of participation is, isn't something we get to have often in classes. And so it's nice to have someone who's been around the block a little bit, but isn't quite as removed from the action as myself. And uh, I look forward to getting to see you more and the questions you have or what you want to put into the course. So I'll talk to you again soon.